If Lee was here, he would say that was awesome. <laughs> thank you, Women's Choir. That was beautiful. And thank you, Bob, for sharing with us that presentation for the children's story. Would you bow your hearts together with me in prayer? Father, we thank you for the experience that we have had with you and one another already during this time of worship. And as we open your word to look at another important aspect of Christian fellowship and realizing the importance of what we're about to study today, I'm offering myself as a vessel of fresh and new into your hands. Please cleanse me with the washing of the blood of your dear son. Please anoint me with the power of your sweet Holy Spirit so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable in your sight so that your purpose, your design purpose might be accomplished for each of us as individuals, as families, and as a church collective because as I pray and praises for victories I give in Christ's name, amen. Today's study is the final session in the series on Christian fellowship. And in our lesson today, we're going to examine how fellowship involves availability and encouragement. I have made a statement with each of the five previous presentation that God intends for his family, the body of Christ, to be tightly knit together, tightly knit together in fellowship. And I'm convicted in my intellect and I'm convinced in my emotions that a part of the glue that wells us together is availability and encouragement. The desire of our Heavenly Father that his family maintain a spirit of encouragement one for another was expressed to the early church over and over and over again and it's still God's desire for his church today. Because availability and encouragement has to be an integral and essential part of our Christian experience one with another if indeed biblical beneficial fellowship is going to not only exist but also flourish. As we read the epistles written by the Apostle Paul under inspiration of God's Holy Spirit it soon becomes very evident that one of the prevailing themes is the principle of how assembling together or making ourselves available to one another not only provides encouragement to others but also provides an opportunity for us to be encouraged ourselves by others. I'm reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another even as also you do. In his letters, Paul is constantly giving Christian believers credit for the good that they were doing. He's constantly affirming them in the Lord, if you will. But he also does not hesitate under Holy Spirit inspiration to urge that there is room for growth. There is room for improvement. There is room for intensity to take place. This verse presents the very essence of our lesson today of availability and encouragement. And there are two points that I want you to notice in this verse. First of all, this verse, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 11, teaches the value 
of being available to one another. The value of assembling together, if you will. Look at it again. Wherefore, comfort yourselves how? Comfort yourselves together. Now, any time we read the word wherefore or therefore, we know that what is being said must be linked to what has just been said. And so let's back up to verse number 10. Who, speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should, what? Live together with him. Now, I may be simplistic, and some people have said I'm simple-minded, but that's all right. But I'm just simplistic enough to believe in my mind and in my heart that because we will live together in heaven, after Jesus takes us there, we should begin practicing now comforting ourselves together. Because just between you and me and ever who you choose to share it with, if we are not willing to comfort ourselves together, together, together now, we may run the risk of not making it to the other side. I believe with all of my mind and all of my heart that it is possible to encourage one another from afar. But I also believe in my mind and heart that it's much easier to do so when we are together. When we assemble ourselves and make ourselves available to one another. The Bible is very plain to teach that indeed we are to comfort one another. But I want to ask you a question. How can you comfort me if I am not willing to make myself available to you? And how can I comfort you if you are not willing to make yourself available to me? How can we comfort one another, as Paul exhorts in these verses, if we are not willing to make ourselves available to one another? Second principle from this verse, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 11 it teaches that as a result of our being available to one another, as a result of our assembling together with one another, we can edify one another. Now, this word edify is a very important word, or it should be in your life and in my life as part of the body of Christ. Because that word edify means to build up and I particularly like what our Seventh-day Adventist commentary says on 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 11. It's found in volume 7, page 254. Listen. Paul shows that the work of encouraging the downhearted is not the work of only the ministry. Would it surprise you if I were to make the statement that some people really believe that that's why the pastor gets paid? That the pastor is to do all of the encouraging? There are actually people who believe that. But our Seventh-day Adventist commentary says, Paul shows that the work of encouraging the downhearted is not the work of only the ministry all Christians. How many Christians? All. One more time. How many Christians? All. all Christians are to comfort their fellows. And as if someone were about to ask, well, how can this be a possibility? It continues. By mutual consideration of such elevated themes as the Lord's coming and the glory of the saints' inheritance, 
church members can build up one another's spiritual courage. Is there anybody else here besides me who ever needs your spiritual courage lifted up and, and edified? We do, don't we? Because we're human. And you have the opportunity to be a part of my spiritual courage. And I have the wonderful opportunity of being part of your spiritual courage. Did you get that? Our availability as church members, one with another, gives us opportunity to share mutual consideration and comfort in the things relative to our Father God that can encourage us. I just got to say hallelujah one more time during this series. Hallelujah for people who have encouraged me in my Christian journey with the Lord. In considering how fellowship involves availability and encouragement, I want us to look at one more passage in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 continues focusing on the high priestly ministry of Christ. In verses 1 through 4, the writer was inspired to share and show the ineffectiveness of animal sacrifices. Look at verse 4. For it is impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. In verses 5 through 18, the writer was impressed and inspired to show the effectiveness and the permanence of Christ's sacrifice. I read verses 10, 12, and 14. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So the animal sacrifices were ineffective. Jesus came and died so that his sacrifice might be effective in your life and in my life. And then in verses 19 through 21, there is a basis for an appeal to accept Christ's high priestly ministry and for us to be his representative. Listen. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God. That's the basis for an appeal for you and I to allow the high priestly ministry of Christ to operate in our lives. And then there is a response to this appeal. Look at verse 22. Your response and my response should be, let us draw near. Because Christ is our great high priest, we should draw near to him. And how, we did, how would, do we do that? With a true heart full of assurance of faith. That is referring to that vertical relationship we established in the very first session. Remember that? Love for God. In verse 23, he says that another aspect of our response should be, let us hold fast. You see, it's not enough just to start out in the way as important as that is, you and I must hold fast 
the profession of our faith without wavering because it's not to the one that starts out in the way but the one that endures unto the end the same shall be saved Jesus is not only able to start us out on the right path Jesus is able to keep us on the right path if we hold on to his unchanging hand amen, amen. and then in verse 24 there's another aspect of the response to the high priestly ministry of Christ let us consider one another to provoke or stimulate unto love and good works what's he saying there the writer saying that you and I should take very careful note of each other's spiritual welfare that is referring to that horizontal relationship we established in the first session so here in these verses we find that there should be a vertical response and there should be a horizontal response to Christ being our great high priest now how can we implement this look at verse 25 there are two points here first of all we can implement this response through our availability not forsaking or not neglecting the what the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is it was very interesting for me a number of years ago to discover that even then some were neglecting to fellowship with their Christian brothers and sisters during seasons of worship they were not making themselves available but the Bible says the way you and I respond is very important and we implement our response by not forsaking not neglecting the assembling of ourselves together or making ourselves available While doing research for the sermon, I read the following that was penned by one of my favorite writers. And it would do us well as individuals and as a collective body to read it often. It's from a work titled, Our High Calling, page 166. Those who are of the household of faith should never neglect the assembling of themselves together now please understand that those are not Pastor Dan's words and God is saying to us today just as God said through this writer who I believe was inspired by God's Holy Spirit to write it that you and I should not be neglecting the assembling of ourselves together and as if someone were about to ask well why is this so important listen for this is God's appointed means of leading his children into unity amen or ouch have you ever wondered why there's such a lack of unity in the body of Christ today? There are many reasons. But I'm convicted in my intellect and I'm convinced in my emotions that one of the prime reasons why there is a lack of unity in the body of Christ today is very simply because there are some today, even as in the days when the book of Hebrews was written, who are neglecting the assembling of themselves together it continues for this is God's appointed means of leading his children into unity in order that in Christian love and fellowship they may help strengthen and encourage one another now again I may be simplistic and you may deem me as being simple minded but I just believe the Bible and my Bible says that you and I should be assembling ourselves together not neglecting this 
even more as the day approaches. Now, what day is that talking about? It's talking about the soon coming of Jesus Christ. And the sooner Jesus comes, the happier I will be. Won't you? And God says, as we are drawing closer and closer to the coming of Christ, we should not be neglecting as a member of the household of faith. We should not be neglecting the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. <laughs> now, I believe that it is possible to have legitimate reasons not to assemble from time to time. But I do not believe there is room for lame excuses. Okay? Did I say that with a smile on my face? Can you see my teeth? There is a difference between legitimate reasons and lame excuses. A number of years ago, there was a song that was written and sung by a very famous quartet called the Kingsman Quartet. The song was titled Excuses. Some of you are nodding your head. You remember that song, don't you? Let me read the words from that song. I would sing it, but I don't want you all to get up and leave. Larry, we're going to have a quartet here one day, and I'll let you sing lead, and I'll sing the baritone, okay? <laughs> excuses, excuses, you'll hear them every day. And the devil, he'll supply them if the church you stay away. When people come to know the Lord, the devil always loses. So to keep them folks away from church, he offers them excuses. In the summer, it's too hot. And in the winter, it's too cold. In the springtime, when the weather's just right, you find some place else to go. Well, it's up to the mountains or down to the beach or to visit some old friend or to just stay home and kind of relax and hope that some of the kinfolks will start dropping in. Well, the church benches are too hard and that choir sings way too loud. Boy, you know how nervous you get when you're sitting in a great big crowd. The doctor told you now you better watch them crowds. They'll get you sick. But you go to that old ball game because you say, it helps me relax. Well, the preacher, he's too young and maybe he's too old. The sermons, they're not hard enough and maybe they're too bold. His voice is much too quiet like. Sometimes he gets too loud. He needs to have more dignity or else he's way too proud. Well, the sermons, they're too long and maybe they're too short. He ought to preach the word with dignity instead of stomp and short, snort. Well, that preacher we've got must be the world's most stuck-up man. Well, one of the ladies told me the other day, he didn't even shake my hand. Excuses, excuses, you'll hear them every day. And the devil, he'll supply them if the church you stay away. When people come to know the Lord, the devil always loses. So to keep them folks away from church, he offers them excuses. So to keep them folks away from church, he offers them excuses. <laughs> The second way that we can implement this response in Hebrews 10 and verse 25 is through our encouragement. He says, exhorting or encouraging one another. There are some translations that render this word exhorting with warning. This Greek word that's used is a very interesting word. It conveys the concept of to call near to invite, to be of good comfort. And so it is biblical to interpret that the writer was being inspired to, to draw attention to how assembling with ourselves together, making ourselves available to one another, can be an encouragement 
in our lives. Now, if this is the case, what is the opposite? If assembly promotes encouragement, what is the opposite? The opposite is to neglect the assembling of ourselves together, to neglect making ourselves available can be a discouragement to others and in our own lives. Have you ever thought of your assembling, you're making yourself available to others? Have you ever thought of that being a call for them to be near you? Have you ever thought about it being an invitation to be close to you so that you can be a source of good comfort to them and they can be a source of good comfort to you? Have you ever thought about that? The dictionary defines encourage this way. To inspire with courage, spirit, or hope. To spur on, to stimulate, to give help, or patronage to. And you and I must never lose focus of the fact, my brothers and sisters, that there are some members of the body of Christ, fellow members of the Christian church, who may be passing this very moment through doubt and discouragement, and you could hold the key of them being encouraged. I had someone ask me a couple of years ago, Pastor, if you knew you were going to die within the next month, what would you want to do? And without hesitating, I said I'd do two things. Number one, and this is not in order of importance, but number one, I would visit my family as much as I could. Not for my benefit, because I won't remember it after I'm gone when the month's over. But I'll do it for their benefit. Because if there's anything between me and them, I want to get it straight. Because I want to leave behind a good testimony. And the second thing, which is really the first thing, I would go to church as much as I could. Because I believe with all of my mind and all of my heart, we can assemble with God outside these four walls. But God has chosen assembling with one another to be a special point of encouragement in our lives and with others. You see, we need a revival of Christian fellowship. And making ourselves available to one another. Not neglecting. Now, you know I love media, don't you? I mean, I was on 3ABN for years. I was one of the first ones ever on 3ABN. Some of you saw the interview with the beginning. They pull up from the archive, me with my beard and had hair. You remember that? But staying home from church and watching 3ABN is not the same as going to church. And you can tell Danny Shelton that if you want to, okay? And he will agree with me. There's something about going to church, fellowshipping with God there, and fellowshipping with one another that will do for us what nothing else will do. We need to make ourselves available so we can encourage. I want to close by taking you to Acts 28. Acts 28. In Acts 27, we read of the shipwreck of the Apostle Paul, and in chapter 28, verses 1 through 10, we have the account of Paul's post-shipwreck experience. In verses 11 through 14, we have the account of Paul traveling toward Rome. Now I want to read verse 15. And from thence, when the brethren heard this, they came to meet us as far as Apiforum and the three taverns, 
who when Paul saw he thanked God and took courage now I believe on your notes I have those words in bold print took courage Pastor Dan, are you, are you trying to tell me that the Apostle Paul, the anointed Apostle to the Gentile, he got discouraged sometimes? I'm not trying to tell you that. I am telling you that. Because Paul was human. One of my favorite writers penned the following description of what took place in that scene of the meeting there at, between Paul and the brethren. I don't want to read it. It's from a work titled the, Apostle, the Acts of the Apostles, pages 448 and 449. On the eighth day after landing, the centurion and his prisoners set out for Rome. Julius willingly granted the apostle every favor which it was in his power to bestow. But he could not change his condition as a prisoner or release him from the chain that bound him to his soldier guard. It was with a heavy heart. Do you get that? It was with a heavy heart that Paul went forward to his long expected visit to the world's metropolis. How different the circumstances from those he had anticipated. How was he fettered and stigmatized to proclaim the gospel? His hopes of winning many souls to the truth in Rome seemed destined to disappointment. Did you get that? At last the travelers reach Apiforum, 40 miles from Rome. As they make their way through the crowds that throng the great thoroughfare, the gray-haired old man, chained with a group of hardened-looking criminals, receives many a glance of scorn and is made the subject of many a rude, mocking jest. Suddenly, a cry of joy is heard, and a man springs from the passing throne and falls upon the prisoner's neck, embracing him with tears and rejoicing as a son would welcome a long-absent father. Again and again the scene repeated as with eyes made keen by loving expectation many discern in the chained captive the one who at Corinth, at Philippi, at Ephesus had spoken to them the words of life. As the warm-hearted disciples eagerly flocked around their father in the gospel the whole company is brought to a standstill the soldiers are impatient of delay, and yet they have not the heart to interrupt this happy meeting, for they too have learned to respect and esteem their prisoner. In that worn, pain-stricken face, the disciples see reflected the image of Christ. They assure Paul that they have not forgotten him, nor cease to love him, that they are indebted to him for the joy, for hope, which animates their lives and gives them peace toward God. In the ardor of their love, they would bear him upon their shoulders the whole way to the city, could they but have the privilege. Few realize the significance of those words of Luke that when Paul saw the brethren, he thanked God and took courage. In the midst of the weeping, sympathizing company of believers who were not ashamed of his bonds, the apostle praised God out loud. The cloud of sadness that had rested upon his spirit was swept away. Hallelujah. His Christian life had been a succession of trials, sufferings, and disappointments. But in that hour, he felt abundantly repaid. With firmer step and joyful heart, 
he continued on his way. He would not complain of the past nor fear for the future. Bonds and afflictions awaited him, he knew. But he knew also that it had been his to deliver souls from a bondage infinitely more terrible. And he rejoiced in his sufferings for Christ's sake. Thank God for the brethren who ministered to the Apostle Paul. And thank God today for brothers and sisters who are still ministering to one another. Because we're all on a journey. And sometimes the journey is hard. And I want to close by thanking every one of you for the hugs you've given me and the encouragement you've been in my life. And I just hope, some way, somehow, I've been able to encourage you a little bit. Because that's what Jesus is all about. To encourage us. And he encourages us. Because he's always available to us. Father, thank you for the privilege one more time of presenting this series on Christian fellowship and Lord I ask that you will infuse every one of us with a desire like we've never had before to not only be with you but also to be with one another so that we can draw encouragement from you and through you, we can be an encouragement to one another. And Father, we know that if your will continues to express itself in just a few months, we will be transplanted to a new location just a few miles from here. And Father, please help Little Creek Fellowship to always be the kind of fellowship where hurting souls can find refuge and relief because this is my prayer in the available name of Jesus. Amen. One more time, let's sing our hymn that has been our theme song for this series. Number 350, Blessed Be the Tie.